It's a real pleasure to see you all again. Um, this session is going to be one of the few we have online. So it's even more a pleasure um, to have with us all, uh, all of you who maybe could not all make it to Oxford. Um, so hi again. Um, we're very pleased tonight to welcome John Horty from the University of Maryland, where he's a professor of philosophy. Um, just some reminders about practicalities. Uh, John will speak for about 30 minutes. Um, we'll take a short break and then we'll start the Q&A that will not be uh, recorded. Um, as always, you can write down the questions in the chat, just say Q and a short summary of your questions so that in the Q&A we can take together uh, questions which are related and the usual system of hands and fingers apply. Um, I think that's all on my part. Um, John, thank you very much for joining us and you have the floor. Okay. Um... Start a clock so I don't go over. So thanks very much for inviting me. Um, for me, it's a chance to present material to a different kind of audience than I'm used to. Um, so that will be kind of fun. I'm talking about the feasibility and open texture. And um, I want to say that these slides that I'm going to be talking from were written for a much longer philosophy talk that actually spanned a couple of days. Um, so I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. So don't let that distract you. Um, <clears throat> here's the general outline. Oh, and one more thing I want to say is that um, my screen might freeze, and if my screen freezes, tell me. Like, if I seem to be talking and what you see doesn't correspond to what I'm saying, just let me know and I'll have to reshare my screen. So I'm going to start talking about open textured predicates in general. And then I'm going to go over an account of the feasible constraint in the common law that I've developed. Um, and then show how it can be adapted to help us understand open texture predicates. And that's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to talk about logic or reasoning, really. Um, so that's going to be it for 30 minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so starting with open texture, just some background. Um, the concept was introduced by Friedrich Weissmann. If you don't know him, he was a logical positivist, a member of the Vienna Circle. He worked with Wittgenstein. During World War II, he migrated to England and finished up his career at Oxford. And he wrote this paper, Verifiability, at a time when um, there was still a lot of discussion of the verification theory of meaning, according to which um, the meaning of a sentence was analyzed in terms of its verification conditions. So here's his example. Well, this is not his example, putting as my cat, but it would be putting as a cat if it looks like a cat, feels furry and purrs, where these statements on the right are if not really experiential, they're closer to experience or privileged in some way. So that was the verification idea. And there was a lot of criticism of this idea based on expressive limitations of this experiential language. Um, Weissman had a deeper um, objection. He didn't think that empirical statements couldn't be analyzed because of expressive limitations. He thought, well, they can't be analyzed, period, because of open texture. Um, <clears throat> there's many definitions of this concept. Weissman himself has one that I think is not all that helpful, but if you, he, he defines open texture as the possibility of vagueness, but if you dig into his paper, um, you can get a definition. He has this idea of essential incompleteness of descriptions, whereas if he has to describe something like his right hand, that's what he chooses, he could start to describe it, but it's never going to be finished. He's never, he's always going to be a, there's always going to be additional relevant things to say. Every description stretches into the horizon of open possibilities. It's very poetic. So my definition of open texture is um, a predicate P is open textured if whenever you um, say enough about an object that makes you think you can ascribe P to that object, you can continue the description so that it seems best to withdraw P as a predicate for that object. So here's the definition of a cat again. Um, but what if a cat becomes gigantic? Um, cats don't do that. You'd say, no, that's not a cat. Or what if it dies and is revived from the dead? Um, cats don't do that. He had some other examples. A man looks like a man, speaks like a man, but it's really teeny. Um, he considered a, a substance that looks like gold, passes all the chemical tests, but has a weird kind of radiation. Um, <clears throat> so what do you do? How do you, there are other 
Wittgenstein had chairs that disappeared and reappeared. Austin had a goldfinch that exploded. Um, these kinds of examples were popular. Um, so what do you do with these concepts? Uh, how do you define them? Weissman's idea was you didn't. Um, you introduce the concept, you limit it in some directions, but you're always aware that there's other directions in which it's not limited that could make you change your picture of the concept. Um, so the, the other thing I wanted to say was that these are sort of philosophers' examples, and we'll get to law, but also in science, there's a lot of open texture. Um, here's an example. Does everybody remember when Pluto used to be a planet? I don't know if you were old enough to remember that. Um, and then they discovered, they decided Pluto wasn't a planet. And they said, okay, now we've got to change our definition of planet. Um, but the working group on extra extrasolar planets didn't do that. It says, rather than construct a new detailed definition, which they're thinking it's going to be wrong too eventually, um, we're just going to accommodate the cases we have. And in the future, we're going to ri ri revise this definition and take a gradualist approach. And that's what he was doing. Um, so it's like he read Weissman. It's like the astronomers read Weissman. Um, so I'm not going to talk about his thought or my logical reconstruction. I'm going to jump to law. Um, most people know open texture from heart. Um, it was in the positive and separation paper. And three years later in concept of law, he changed his view a little bit. And because of that, and because it's an interesting topic, um, there's a literature. I see Brian Bix is here. Um, there's a literature in the law, and here are some, some examples. Hart's example, of course, was no vehicles in the park. Um, so if there's a sign that says that, I can't drive my car into the park, but I can take my Apple Pencil into the park. Um, but then there's all these borderline cases. So he used, a, he used an artificial example, but of course there's real examples everywhere. Um, in America, there was a, a case about whether a burrito is a sandwich. Somebody had rented a strip mall area to a sandwich shop and part of the rental clause was they couldn't rent to another sandwich shop and they rented it to a burrito shop. And so that went to court. Um, in England, there's the question whether Pringles are potato chips because the manufacturers of Pringles wanted to escape the value added tax on potato products. Um, Currently, there are issues about whether Uber drivers are employees or contractors. This goes on and on. I'm not going to talk about these things. I will talk about the super scoop because um, I'm going to use this as an example. The super scoop, does anybody know the super scoop? The super scoop was a, a dredge in the Boston Harbor that um, it was a dredge sitting on a barge and um, it couldn't move around. It had to be towed. It was the largest dredge in the world. And a man, Willard Stewart, was injured while working on the super scoop due to the negligence, he thought, of the owners. And he wanted compensation for negligence, but he could only get that through the Jones Act, which applies to seamen. Seamen are people who work on vessels. Um, so the question of whether the super scoop was a vessel, this barge, um, went through three levels of um, litigation and wound up in the Supreme Court. So there are these real cases, there's this literature, but there's not what I would call an actual semantic theory of open texture predicates in the sense that a semanticist would recognize. And that's what I wanna to try to provide by, um, by in, in a weird sort of way, by describing this account of constraint in the common law and then extending that to open texture predicates. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the common law a little bit. Um, you know, when I talk about this for philosophers, I, I do talk quite a bit about this, but I'm gonna skip the motivation for this audience. Um, common law cases come up, decisions get made, and somehow magically um, law emerges out of that process through um, precedent mostly. So how does this happen? I'm gonna spare you my whole taxonomy of approaches it's in the introduction that I sent out to most of you. Um, I'm just going to start with the idea that constraint depends on rules. So when a court faces a case, it either draws on a previous rule, formulates a new rule, and that rule carries the constraint to future cases. 
Um, <clears throat> so there's different ways of doing this. The rules can be defeasible. I like that idea. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, the rules can be strict, like regular if-then rules in logic. Um, this, this view bifurcates too. The strict rules, some people think, well, at least Larry Alexander and Emily and Sherwin think, at least they think that, that the strict rules have to be applied exactly as they're stated. But most people feel like they get, cases can be distinguished. Where distinguishing is the process of looking at a, a past case in which a rule was formulated and noticing differences in a current case, which justify you in not applying that past rule to the current case with the effect that the rule is modified. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I usually, because it's clear, I usually motivate this with family examples um, and because I don't want to get into the details of law. Um, so imagine that my wife and I have two kids, Emma, age nine, and Max, age 14. Um, and we treat each other's decisions regarding the kids as precedents, right? We respect each other's decisions. So suppose Emma goes to my wife and says, um, can I stay up and watch TV tonight? And she, she's nine, she didn't eat her dinner, but she did do her homework. And my wife says, yes, honey, because you're at least nine, you can now stay up and watch TV. Um, so this is a case, there's facts, there's an outcome and there's a rule justifying the outcome, right? And now imagine that the next day, Max comes to me and says, can I stay up and watch TV? Um, he's 14, he didn't even do his dinner and didn't do his homework either. And I say, no, 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 because you didn't do your homework, you can't stay up and watch TV. So he could then complain. He could say, well, but last night, and he would, last night, um, in the case of Emma, you know, the rule was formulated according to which children nine years old or greater can stay up and watch TV. Um, and what distinguishing lets me do is to go in and say, okay, let me just fix that. At least nine and you did your homework, then you could watch TV. So I've gone back and modified that rule. Um, so that's a natural process of reasoning, even outside of law. And you can see it, you can see it justified in various ways, maybe, I think my wife didn't say what she meant properly. It's sort of a paternalistic view of justification. Maybe I think it's what she would have said if she'd envisioned this case, but she didn't. Um, maybe I just think this is a better set of outcomes. I don't know. Um, but it's a natural process of reasoning, at least a dilemma. The dilemma is, well, if you can't modify the rules, how do you get this natural process of reasoning and if you can modify the rules, where does constraint go? If you can change the rules anytime you don't like the outcome, um, how are you constrained by the rules? Now, as it happens, there's a response in the literature due to um, Joseph Raz and Brian Simpson, which says you can modify the rules, but only in certain ways. Um, and I'm not gonna go through that much as I'd like to. Instead, I'm gonna present a different approach, which turns out to be equivalent. <laughs> um, well, what I think is, if you go that way, you have to say, you have to justify modifying the rules in these ways and not other ways. And I try to justify it by appeal to this, this approach. Um, so this is a, an idea that I got from Grant Lamont and from work in artificial intelligence and law. Um, and I'm gonna start with the representation of cases. This is gonna be a little bit of notation. And if you don't like it, if you've got any questions, I mean, <laughs> Um, just raise your hand, raise your little yellow hand or your actual flesh hand, or just speak up. Um, so situations are analyzed in terms of factors, which are legally significant facts or patterns of facts. Um, so there's factors for the plaintiff, pi, and for the defendant, delta. So in my silly little example, the kids are always the plaintiffs. They always want something. So um, being nine or older or doing your homework, those are pro-plaintive factors. The poor defendants, um, if the kid didn't eat the dinner or misbehaved at school, those are pro-defendant factors. Um, and I just wanna say that this way of representing cases, I'm just using it in a, a simple, almost cartoonish aspect. 
but it's developed in great detail in AI and law by really beautiful work by Edwin Arisland and Kevin Ashley. And um, they did this first in the trade secrets domain. So suppose you steal what I think is my trade secret. I can establish that and, I, and so I sue you, I'm the plaintiff by saying I took measures to establish confidentiality, um, to establish, to protect the information, we had a confidentiality agreement. You can claim pro-defendant factors are, well, well, look, the information is publicly available and so on. Um, so given this factor representation, a case is just a set of factors um, <clears throat> divided into those that favor the plaintiff and the defendant. So here's an example, pi one through three and delta one through four, that's a case. Um, a reason is a set of factors favoring one side. Um, a reason holds in a situation if all the factors belonging to the reason belong to that situation. And where W is a reason favoring the side S, a rule just says W favors S. So pi one, pi two favors pi. That's a, that's a defeasible case rule. Um, we have functions that pick up the premise and the conclusion. So a case in our little formal representation is just a fact situation, an outcome, and a rule justifying the outcome. That's all it is. So here's an example. Um, pi one through three for the plaintiff, delta one through four for the defendant. And you can imagine the court looks at this and says, okay, because of pi one, pi two, I'm going for the plaintiff. Okay, that's the decision. Clear so far? Okay, now I'm gonna give you this different model of constraint. Um, according to which constraint is not based on rules, but on an ordering relation on reasons that you build up over time um, as the case base is developed. And what you have to do is keep consistent with that ordering relation on reasons. So to motivate it, Start with this case, pi one, pi two for the plaintiff, delta one, delta two for the defendant. Suppose the court looks at this and says, because of pi one, I'm going for the plaintiff. Okay, what's the court saying? It's saying that the premise of the rule, pi one, is more important than the strongest reason for the other side, delta one, delta two, or else it would have decided for the other side. Okay, so you get a little piece of an ordering right there. Um, it's saying more. If the premise of the rule, pi one, is stronger than delta one, delta two, then anything that is itself stronger for the winning side, the plaintiff in this case, is gonna be itself stronger, have higher priority <clears throat> than anything that's weaker for the losing side. Somebody asking a question? No. Okay, so what you get from this is a definition according to which, given a case, it follows from that case that a reason Z has higher priority or more weight than a reason W, just in case Z is a superset of the premise of the rule and W is a reason for the other side that holds in that case. Okay, All right, now I'm gonna do, I'm gonna draw a picture. Because even though that picture's in the notes, it's possible that you didn't read the notes and um, it helps to see it evolve in person, I find. So here's a picture of what's going on. These are all the factors and they're divided into the factors favoring the side S and the factors favoring the other side. And here's a case which kind of spans the factors, a situation, right? And so what the court decides is, this is the premise of the rule, because of this reason, I'm going for side S. So what, what you hear, what, what the case tells you, the information you get is that any reason of this form, Z, has higher priority than any reason of this form, W. So you get W, according to this case, Z has higher priority than W. Okay, and not just this, but this Z prime has higher priority than this W prime. You get a lot of, you get a lot of information from a single decision.
Okay, so that's the ordering derived from a case. You just lift it to a case space. Um, Z is more important than W according to the case space gamma. If there's some case in there according to which Z is more important than W, that's easy. Now there's two simple definitions. A case space is consistent. Remember the case space has generated this ordering on reasons. It's consistent if there's no reasons such that it thinks each of those is more important than the other. It's a simple notion of consistency. Um, and now constraint is also simple. Given a consistent case space gamma and a situation, um, the court is required to decide on the basis of some rule favoring the side. is consistent. That's all. You just have to preserve consistency. That's all there is to it. So here's some examples. Um, here we are. So take the court looks at pi one, pi two. We've already looked at this and decides for pi. So this tells us that pi one is more important than delta one, delta two. Now suppose it sees delta one, pi one, delta one, two, three. And here, which is a different case, here it says, okay, now I'm going to go for delta because this it can't do because this says pi one is more important than delta one, delta two. And this decision would say that delta one, delta two is more important than pi one. That's inconsistent. It's making a circle. <clears throat> the court can here decide for delta if it wants using a different reason, a little bit hard to draw. delta one, delta three. And then this tells you that, well, we already knew that pi one is more important than delta one, delta two. And this just says delta one, delta three is more important than pi one. That's consistent. And here's my like little intuitive example. Um, going to the movies is more fun than going to the beach with your parents, but going to the beach with your friends is more fun than going to the movies. So which kid doesn't think that? Okay, I'm just gonna say something about a dionic interpretation. What we're, what we're saying here is, um, what I told you so far is what rules you can decide a case on the basis of, but you can lift this to what sides you have to decide for. Um, given a case based in a new situation, you can require a decision for a side S if every rule, every allowable rule supports S. Um, and a decision for a side S is permitted if some allowable rule supports S. This is just a normal kind of modal definition of ought and can. And so if you let SX mean X is decided for S, this says, um, you ought to decide for X. This says you can decide for X. And then we have facts like you're permitted to decide for X if you're not required to decide for the other side. That sounds sensible. And in any situation, either you're required to decide for one side or you're required to decide for the other side or you're permitted to decide for any side. So this gives you a sensible looking little logic. I just wanted to say one thing about reasoning. It's a little bit off the main track. <laughs> um, what's difficult about the common law is that it slips between two well understood views of reasoning. I'm not going to go into this. One is reasoning with serious rules, like taking the rules seriously, really applying them. This is what Alexander and Sherwin thinks. The other is just thinking, trying to do the best you can. This is natural reasoning. Um, you get reasons, you give them the weight you think they have. They lead you to decisions. This is how most of us think about most things. Um, they, they both have advantages and disadvantages. My view is a, a form of natural reasoning, like this picture of constraint comes along with a nice form of reasoning. Um, and the form of reasoning is, remember there were reasons and you give them the weights they have. Um, you can't quite do that. 
You give them the weights you would give them, but you have to adjust the weights you give your reasons to respect the weights assigned to them by the background case base. That's all there is. Um, so here you are, you're a court, you're facing a situation against a case base. Here's your ordering on reasons, what you think is important. You don't decide on the basis of that. You decide on the basis of your ordering on reasons modified ever so slightly to be consistent with um, the ordering that has been already determined by the case base. I think that's a natural picture of what's going on. Um, and it locates common law strangely within the social choice literature. So you have a bunch of courts with their own orderings on reasons. So this is a way of using those orderings to generate a global ordering on reasons. This is the ordering that society is going to have. And this is constructed in a way that's piecemeal, incremental, distributed. Okay. <clears throat> Gonna skip values. Let's go back to open texture. So you probably see what's coming. <laughs> um, instead of having plaintiff and defendant, I'm just gonna have an open texture predicate P and it's contrary. So if P is vessel, then not P is not a vessel. Um, so for, for these open texture or cat, um, there are factors pro and cons. For each open texture predicate, there's a bunch of factors favoring application of that predicate to a thing. For cat, it's being furry, purring. Um, an opposing application of a predicate of that thing, becoming gigantic. Um, there's a set of cases in which the predicate's already been applied, and then you get the same decisions. You're either required to apply the predicate in a new situation, required to apply the complement of the predicate, or permitted to go either way. So what this theory gives you are norms for application rather than truth conditions. Um, of open texture statements. I think that's the right way to go. So here's an example. The super scoop, um, let V be the predicate vessel. There's all these factors, these pro-vessel factors, being subject to Coast Guard regulations, having captain and crew and navigation lights and so on. There's some anti-vessel factors, not having self-propulsion, not having navigation of your real business, um, so when the super scoop came before the first district court, there had been a previous case, the Betty F. The super scoop was a barge supporting a dredge. The Betty F was a barge supporting a crane that was used to build a bridge. Um, and the Betty F had these four pro-vessel factors, but its primary business was not navigation and it wasn't moving at the time. And the court said, because of that, it's not a, it's not a vessel, is more important than this reason for thinking it's a vessel. So you're getting this ordering on reasons there. Um, then when the super scoop came, as it happened before the very same court, the court said, look, not only do I think it's not a vessel, but in any way, my hands are tied because we've got a precedent, the Betty F, and we've already decided that this is more important than this. And so there you go. Um, so that was the super scoop. Let's get the modified super scoop. So my hypothesis is that natural language is like this too, except in law, of course, the set of cases is carefully curated, it's organized, there are hierarchies. Um, in natural language, the background cases are indefinite, local, changing, you can do funny things. Now, let me talk about heart. Let me go back to hearts on open texture. Hart's view was that there was the core and the penumbra. He said, if we're gonna communicate at all, then the general words we use have some standard instances in which no doubts are felt about application. So there must be a core of settled meaning. I take this to be like an argument. He's thinking because there must be cases in which there's no doubts, no doubts felt about application. There must be a core of settled meaning. 
There's also a number of cases where we're really not sure which to go. Um, so that's Hart's picture. I'm guessing you're mostly familiar with it. Um, So let me just contrast these two pictures. Hart has the core of settled meaning, which determines applicability or not applicability in the clear cases. And then there's the penumbral cases where what to say is just not clear. Um, on the current view, there's a background set of cases, there's precedent cases, and that requires the application in some future cases and for business application and others. Um, then there's a range of cases in which, remember, you can go either way. You're permitted to apply the predicate or not to apply the predicate. So um, this is like the core, and this is like the penumbra. But notice, I don't. there's no meaning. I'm not talking about core and penumbral meaning. There's not even meaning. There's just background cases. So that's a difference. <laughs> And I think it's an advantage. Um, and here's my argument. Um, core meaning is either not sufficiently dynamic or else it's redundant. Um, <clears throat> so go back to the Betty F and um, the super, the super sloop, scoop. I don't know why I'm saying sloop. Before the Betty F decision, the super scoop, I think would say it lay in the penumbra. That's what Hart would say, right? It, a decision could have gone either way. In fact, the first district court decided it was not a vessel and the Supreme Court reversed that. The Supreme Court thought it was a vessel. Um, but then after the Betty F decision, the, the super scoop was moved out of the penumbra into the core. So it's determined by, well, into the anti-extension of the core. It's clearly a not a vessel after the Betty F decision, okay? So something changed. Um, what changed? Well, the set of precedents changed. The, the set of precedents now included the Betty F decision. Um, so does the, did the, what happened to the core meaning? Did it change too? So there's two options, either no, in which case, okay, fine, then the core meaning isn't explaining why you couldn't before and can now confidently classify the super scoop as not a vessel. Okay, that's one option. Or yes, the core meaning changed. And okay, the core meaning changes with the set of precedent cases. The set of precedent cases itself is sufficient to determine applicability of the predicate. So what additional work is the core meaning doing? That's my argument for Okay, now I'm just gonna to jump to the end. I know I'm two minutes over. I've been exploring open texture, constraint and common law, not talking about reasoning. I like this as a philosopher because then coming from these formal models of legal reasoning, you get kind of semantic pictures of um, open texture predicates, which we don't have. Um, <clears throat> I also work in AI, and I think this is really interesting for AI. Um, Here's another quote from Hart. Human invention is throwing up funny situations that classifier must make a decision which is not dictated by facts and phenomena. Um, instead, when somebody's applying one of these open texture predicates, someone's got to take responsibility um, for the practical consequences of these decisions. There have to be social aims, consciously controlled social aims at work. So there's all this value language around. <laughs> Um, and this is really interesting to me, and especially interesting because he uses the phrase classifier. He's clearly thinking of a person, um, but when I teach intro to AI, I have my students write classifiers. They learn concepts. Um, in my case, I teach them to learn the concept of a beetle and how to distinguish a beetle from an ordinary bug by reinforcement learning. Um, but what Hart is saying is, no, you can't do that um, because there's all these values at work. So it's not like there's a fact that we're learning about whether the super scoop is a vessel. We're deciding if we want it to be a vessel or not. That's the decision we have to make. Um, 
So what I would say, the final thing I want to say is, okay, good. So move this to language. What values are now in play? A lot of ordinary languages, like when I fight with my son, he can go out if his room is clean. He has to stay home if his room's not clean. Okay, so there's a lot of discussion about what clean means. Um, and our values clash over that to, in, over that open texture predicate. Um, but often there's epistemic values at work. And that's what was going on in the, the planet case. Um, there's a really interesting paper. So the astronomers were basically thinking, well, planet is gonna be a more useful concept for us if it excludes Pluto and things like that than if it includes Pluto. Um, that's what they were thinking. And there's a great paper uh, called Concept Utility by Paul Egre and Cathal Madigan um, in Journal of Philosophy a few years ago, explaining why the, why the non-Pluto concept of planet is a better concept. I'm done. Thank you.